Good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending on where you're on the world. Thank you for joining us for the European track of the Barclays Global Financial Services Conference. Sorry, we're a couple of minutes late to get started. Uh, had some technical issues that we've overcome. We're really, really grateful to have Simon Cooper here um, from Standard Chartered. Simon is the CEO of the Corporate Commercial and Institutional Banking Division. Um, having joined the bank in 2016, Simon has a wealth of experience in corporate finance, corporate banking and transaction banking. So, so first and foremost, Simon, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate you making yourself available. No, thanks, man. Thanks for having me. So um, it's not the transatlantic trip I was expecting, but, but we'll make do digitally. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Um, hopefully next year uh, we'll, we'll get a chance to meet face to face. Um, just before we kick things off, for anyone who's dialed in, I just want to uh, point you to the audience response survey questions in uh, in the margin hopefully you guys are familiar with that uh, if you do get the chance please do fill them out it's a nice fun interactive part of the session um, and also as another reminder you do have the ability to submit questions directly into us we'll collate them and run them by simon um, cool so just to transition basically to the main event um, simon again thank you very much for your time appreciate it so many of your key markets particularly in asia are arguably ahead of um other regions, particularly the West, in their experience with COVID. Interested in what kind of update you can provide? What are you seeing in terms of business performance activity as we emerge from the initial stages of the pandemic? Okay, thanks. So, so I think you're right. You know, as, as the crisis hit, I think the, the initial phase was really characterized, and I guess particularly so, as you say, in, in Europe and the Americas, by clients focusing really on their balance sheets on protecting liquidity, protecting ratings. And we saw you know, initially uh, RCF drawdowns and then incremental bank liquidity lines as people looked to, to shore that up. And at that time, if you remember back, you know, the CP markets, the DCM markets were, were broadly, broadly closed. That's now changed and we've seen record DCM in the investment grade market and we've started to see an, an opening in the high yield market. What that meant for me and for my business was we were able to capitalize on that, I think, reasonably well. So we were able to support clients, uh, particularly in, in the US and Europe at that point in time, participating in those, those fundings and those balance sheets shoring up and starting to get payback now in terms of activity taking place in our markets, be that in terms of transaction banking or, uh, or financial markets or, or increasing in our debt capital markets. And I think in you know, many instances, we were able to sort of up-tier our, our overall position with clients. When you turn to, to our footprint, and, and I guess Asia in particular, actually, we saw the same, but to a much lesser degree. You know, clients were typically already well-placed in terms of their balance sheets, uh, and the financial market stayed open. So um, you, know, you look at China now, and it's full of, of liquidity and, and pricing still tight. That contrast to, to Europe and the Americas, where actually we were able to see an uptick in pricing uh, in the debt markets. But I think as we as we look forward, you know, we're, we're seeing clients actually remain reasonably bullish, I think. I mean, the, the key themes that have come out are firstly digital. I think it, every client, be they financial institution, be they corporate, are really focusing on, on digitization and how they interact with us in a digital fashion. You, you remember back, I, I think I talked to, at, at the last conference about you know, creating a digital channels and data to group uh, coming into me. Uh, I guess by, by luck rather than judgment, that has proved you know, really prescient in terms of, of you know, we've moved from trying to convince clients to interact digitally to clients insisting on interacting digitally. And, and we're going to see, you know, I think, significant investment from, from us and from our clients in the, the digital space going forwards. I think that the second theme you're seeing is one of focus. You know, we're, we're seeing people start to, to narrow down uh, the business areas they're looking at. So you know, if, if, you're, if you're a broad real estate client, actually you're, you're shifting away from looking at offices, you're shifting now more towards logistics or data. We're starting to see, we, we just acted for uh, SingLife on, on the acquisition of some of Aviva's businesses in Southeast Asia. Again, clients looking to really focus on what they're doing and consequently what they don't do. And then sustainability would be the other you know, strong call out. 
where we, we see it obviously in our footprint is a real opportunity for Standard Chartered, but clients are really starting to, to live the sustainability agenda in terms of the way they're acting, the way they're thinking of tapping markets. Geographically, uh, actually China remains important. Uh, I guess both in terms of, of it as a domestic market, the potential for, for domestic consumption. Uh, we're seeing you know, a large brewer doing, doing some, some acquisition activity to consolidate its position in China. I think we're starting to see more Chinese clients look at you know, South Asia, South East Asia, in terms of, of opportunities for them to, to flow out. Uh, so, you know, it was definitely a challenging start to the year. But you know, I, I guess when you look at, at my part of the bank and, and, and the business I run, you know, we were up 9% year on year from an income perspective. Uh, and that was really driven by client activity in our, uh, in our footprint. Um, okay, perfect. Can, can I draw into a couple of those those comments then around revenue? Um, C, you know, CIB uh, division that you uh, major division for Standard Charter that you that you're responsible for was a real source of revenue strength for the group in H1, notably within financial markets. Um, interested in how much of that do you think reflected broader buoyant conditions that we observed globally? In financial markets, which may be hard to repeat, versus how much of that do you think reflects the kind of structural repositioning of that business that you've undertaken in recent years? So, I think as you look at what we've been doing, we clearly have done a lot of restructuring of the financial markets business. Um, it's, it's definitely true to say that you know, we benefited from the volatility that was there, but as I try and quantify that in terms of our um, markets revenue that came through, actually, I think I think really probably only about 50% came from market conditions. I think the, the balance really came from that, that strategy we've had to you know, deepen client relationships, to, to invest in the digitization that we've already just touched on uh, of the markets business, and then to expand our overall products and, and geographic capabilities. So, you know, if, if you start to think about that going forward, that means that, you know, yes, we've benefited from, from volatility, but, but the base that we're, we're looking forward from has, uh, yeah, as I think, increased. So, so as we look forward, it gives, it's not just riding a volatility curve. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you drill down into that a bit more, you know, we've seen a lot more revenue coming in from, from more complex and, and structured deals. We've seen a lot more client activity in terms of digital channels and, and that, that investment in, in, in digital platform and technology has started to pay off. Um, okay, cool. I mean, to that, to that, to that effect then, how, how should we think about revenue performance in financial markets and H2? Is there anything that you're able to tell us about conditions that you've experienced in Q3 um, relative to H1? Yeah, well, I, I, I haven't been on holiday in August, but it does seem like everybody else in Europe and, and the Americas did go on holiday. So we, we certainly saw a little bit of a dip in, in August, as is, to be honest, as is normal in, in August for, for our markets business. And we, we've seen you know, that, that volatility come down from its peak. But you know, as, as, we, as we go into the last part of September now, actually the, the FM business financial markets business has maintained pretty good momentum. You know, we're starting to see good signs of in, in, uh, improvement in terms of global credit. We're seeing our credit structure and distribution group starting to, to pick up businesses as, as you know, demand for emerging market assets pick up. Uh, and, and investors you know, in this environment are, are continuing to chase duration and yield. And, and clearly that's, that's an asset class that fits very well in terms of standard charters footprint and what we can what we can create. Um, that's really helpful. Um, I guess the offset to that financial market strength um, that we saw coming through in, in Q2, uh, and I guess which faces a bit more of a challenging outlook is transaction banking, um, you know, namely cash management, trade finance, significant revenue streams for, for CIB. 
impacted by rate cuts and, and weaker trade. How are you thinking about these businesses? Um, and you know, do, you think that's a, do you think that's a fair characterization of the outlook, firstly? And then secondly, is there anything that you can do in order to, to regain momentum in that business, which I think actually has been pretty impressive up until basically until what we've seen take place this year? So your, your observations about, I guess, transaction banking businesses across the board uh, is fair. You know, I think I think some of our competitors were down significantly more than us. We were probably middle of the pack uh, on average. Um, the US bank probably were more effective in terms of some of the mitigation of, of the interest rate headwinds with, with much higher liabilities. But we, we've seen our liabilities grow as well. I think the, um, you know, in terms of what we think about uh, the repositioning of our TV business overall, you know, first, the first thing in terms of cash, you know, we're not assuming uh, a massive pickup in interest rates. You know, I suspect they're going to stay flat for, for a long period of time. But where, where we see upside is in terms of the, the volume of liabilities. So if you look at our, our Mark 1 numbers, you know, average liabilities were up about 22% year on year. And they, they continue to, to hold true. So we continue to expect you know, volumes to, to, to hold up in the, in the cash business, which in part offset some of the, the um, margin compression that's come from rates. But, but one of the key levers there is to, to move you know, the deposit mix. So we move away from um, corporate time deposits, uh, and, and, and make sure the mix is increased in terms of the proportion of CASA um, and therefore, as you look at the, you know, we talked at the start about clients from Europe and the Americas getting getting good transactional business flows from them. Clearly, that results in increased CASA and also fee income. So as, as we start to, to to get more of that business, we'll be able to drive fee income from clearing for payments, and those do start to, to mitigate. Uh, those low and low net interest margins. I think some of the, the sectors that we're looking at as well play well into that strategy. You know, we're, we're looking at, at some of the, the new payment uh, players and fintechs and the whole greater Bay Area that, that clearly is right on our doorstep uh, really starts to, to dovetail into that. When you combine that with what we've done from a technology perspective, you know, S to B pay, SC pay, you know, that connectivity into clients, making it easier for them to, to transact and move money around with us, that, that results in those, those liabilities picking up. So, yeah, I guess we've got something like a 40% uplift in volumes through digitization as we look forward. Uh, and we've, we've got a, now an instant payment capability across 15 of our top markets. If you look at the the trade side of, of transaction banking, then actually we, we took some actions ourselves in terms of um, financial institutional trade loans. And we, we took those down deliberately uh, at the peak of the crisis, making sure that we were you know, preserving liquidity, maximizing liquidity for ourselves, uh, and, and also maximizing return. Uh, they, they were lower returning trade assets. We're now starting to see trade flows come back, particularly intra-regional trade flows in the last few weeks and months, uh, again, which, which we're well um, positioned to, to capitalize on. And I think that the shape of trade is changing as well. We're seeing a much greater shift towards open account uh, away from the traditional documentary trade. And, and again, that plays into everything I've talked about, about digital, about using data uh, and capturing our footprint business. So. Correct, historically, I, I'm, I'm probably a little bit more optimistic than you are looking forward. Perfect. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have uh, come into me. Um, so uh, I guess it, it's, it's probably touching upon the theme uh, that, that I was looking to ask you, ask you next. Clearly, key region for the business, Hong Kong and the Great, Greater Bay area. Um, how how's recent geopolitical tensions um, between, I guess, the, the West and China um, principally impacting your business? You know, what what is the what's the mood on the ground 
amongst locals and multinational corporates and institutions? I, th I think you've got to be you've got to be careful about, in, in part, what 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 is driving the mood at the moment. Um, I mean, Hong Kong at the moment is in recession, but that's very much driven by COVID. Uh, I think in terms of the tensions between uh, China and the US, uh, we're seeing that much less impactful on, on clients at the moment. I think we're seeing a lot of clients focus on you know, the whole Greater Bay Area uh, and, and I think a, 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 an increasing belief that, that that Greater Bay Area could be a catalyst to pull Hong Kong out of, out of that recession I just talked about. You know, it, it's... You put it in context, 11 cities, 72 million people, an economy you know, probably north of $1.6 trillion, 60% of which is, is domestic and on Hong Kong's doorstep. So with, with China, I think, looking at itself in this sort of post-COVID uh, mood, we're seeing actually good activity, good volumes of business in, in the Greater Bay Area. That's that's feeding across into I think optimism within within Hong Kong. Uh, if you look at the multinational space, then I think again actually we, we surveyed you know, about fifty of our of our multinational clients, particularly out of Europe and, and the Americas, and I don't think we had one who said that they didn't continue to see China as an important market, um, both in terms of its domestic consumption but also in terms of China's you know, expansion overseas, particularly into the rest of Asia and, uh, and South Asia. So you know, a, lo a lot of noise politically, clearly, clearly you know, we're all watching that and seeing what, what could come from that. But, but clients on the ground are, are, I think, relatively bullish in terms of that, that tension, but, but are mindful that COVID itself uh, and coming on the back of you know, a few months of, of disruption from protests has, has put Hong Kong itself into into a recession. It, does it does it does it make it harder for Standard Chartered to operate in the region, or does it does it generate opportunities? Is if if, if the situation was to evolve, escalate, or de-escalate, is there any kind of action that you might be looking to take in response to to any of that? So I think when you, when you look at what clients have been doing anyway, you know, we've seen them already start to expand into both South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, from a supply chain perspective and from a, from a capital perspective. But, you know, we're, we're, we're well positioned for that. We're well positioned to help Chinese clients do that. We're well positioned to help you know, other multinational non-Chinese clients do that. Um, so you, as you see, manufacturing and, and the like diversify. We, we have definitely benefited from that as a result of our, of our footprint throughout Asia. And Bill announced last week the sort of reorganization of the group and putting Asia together, I think, far, further emphasizes how we can position ourselves to capture that. Um, yeah, I, I think if, if tensions really, really escalate, nobody benefits. But, but at the moment, uh, as I say, business is relatively sanguine. And, and I see more opportunities and threats. Perfect. Um, so, so thanks for that, Simon. Just as a, another reminder to anyone who might be dialed in to the, uh, to the webcast, if you are able to, please do participate in the ARS polling questions in the margin to the left. Uh, we'll, we'll run the, through those shortly. And just another reminder to send any questions in directly to us. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll collate them. Um, one uh, one area I did want to talk about was was asset quality. I guess we we are in the midst of a, a historic global pandemic. Your charge, your impairment charge in Q two um, across commercial and CIB was was broadly in line with the broader group at around eighty to ninety basis points, um, and that you know that did look like it was relatively lower reserve building than we might have seen elsewhere. Um, at, you know other banks to have reported uh, in in the US and Europe. Just in how comfortable do you feel with capital portfolios? Uh, and are you observing any material signs of distress as things stand? It felt pretty high where I was sitting. Um, my returns have been a lot better without it. I, I think, look, 
if, if you look back over the last last four years, we, we've done a huge amount in terms of improving uh, discipline around origination and, and, and capital allocation at global and regional levels. And we set up the, the credit portfolio management team and, and we've transitioned our portfolio. So the, the, the CIB portfolio is now you know, just under 60% strong or, or investment grade. I think it's 57%. The commercial bank, you know, since, since we took control of that, has, has shifted as well. So we've now got about 28%, up from 25%, 26% in investment grade. So we start off from a, a balance sheet that is a, in a much healthier position than, than, than I think people would have expected of Standard Chartered in the past. That said, you know, so it, felt, it felt like we were taking some provisions when I sit here, and, and, and we did. We, we took some overlay provisions you know, across the non-purely proportionary book of about 200 million bucks. So that's 20 basis points uh, on top of the, the provisions going from, from MEV. So, so I, I feel we've, I think we've provisioned fairly um, and, and we're not seeing, at the moment, touch wood, we're not seeing clients move into you know, significant amounts of stress. The, the, the numbers we've seen are, are modelled and or overlay provisions largely with a couple of, of frauds at the beginning of the year that, that, that worsen the position. Um, so when you, when you look across you know, what, what we've undertaken by, by sector, can, it's difficult to compare to the, to the peers, but you know, looking at oil and gas, commodities, aviation, metals and mining, etc., I think we're, we've done a pretty comprehensive review uh, of the book. And I feel we're, we're, we're pretty well covered. Um, I think you, know, you, you, you talked earlier on about the different stages of, of, sort of the COVID cycle. And, and, and in part, I think it's possible that, that because we, we've obviously got a large Greater China, North Asia, ASEAN presence, you know, some of those markets have recovered more quickly than have some of the markets in the West. Those, market, those clients that we do have in the West are, are predominantly investment grade. So, so the balance is, is, is actually quite helpful from a, from a relative risk perspective. Yeah, I guess, I, I, I mean, you read my mind there. I mean, that was the next question I was going to ask you. Uh, and it does seem that I guess you would agree with this, um, that, you know, kind of at the initial point and the initial observation is given your regional focus, it does sound like you, you think you do have a greater visibility that's on asset quality Albeit, the, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty out there, but you know, given your, your regional focus, uh, greater visibility than, say, in the US and, and Europe, which are further behind in that experience? I think we, we're, we're seeing more, um, more return to, to, to normal in terms of activity. If you look at uh, you know, domestic flights in China, you know, really... You know, almost at pre-COVID levels. Uh, look at a proportion of, of staff back in offices in China, Korea, Hong Kong. You know, we're starting to see that. I would say several months preceding the West. So it, I, mean, I guess it gives the West comfort and hope in terms of what the direction of travel will look like. But it gives me, arguably, as you say, a greater line of sight as to where the, the stress points are. And you know, I, I think. Everybody was, was, was quick to react. You know, I like you've been through many crises, now, none, none quite like this. But you know, the people's balance sheet started off generally stronger. And actually, corporate treasures were very quick, as we talked about earlier, to, to, to really strengthen their balance sheets and, and, and put liquidity in the right place in time, uh, certainly amongst our clients. Okay. Great. Um, it might be good to pause here for a second then. and switch to our ARS polling uh, questions. These are six questions. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to fill these out in the margin. Uh, please do, do feel free to, to continue doing so. Um, I, I will read this out for the benefit of anyone that's not looking uh, at, the, at, at the web link and the questions and answers. And Simon, I'll run through the results with you. Um, but to, to kick things off then, so question one, what would cause you to become more positive on standard chartered shares? I'm on Rakar's research report. <laughs> um, one, one is positive revenue surprises, two, 
greater cost savings, three, better asset quality, four, stronger capital, high dividends, uh, number five, a de-escalation in US-China trade tensions. Um, so the answers came out. Uh, the lead is positive revenue surprises. Uh, it's probably about half of the responses followed closely by a de-escalation in US-China trade tensions, uh, about 40% of the answers. Um, I wouldn't say too much of a surprise. I don't know if, I don't know if that's noteworthy to you. Well, not really. I, th I think if, if you go back to you know, when I talked about setting a strategy for CCIB when I arrived, I talked about the drivers of returns being revenue, cost, uh, and, and RWA, which sort of comes into into those answers. Actually, all of those have to have to happen to be to be successful. And, and touch wood, so far they are. Um, perfect. The um, next question. How do you think about Standard Charter's cost development versus expectations? Um, option one, likely to beat expectations thanks to cost saving initiatives, likely to meet expectations, likely to miss due to cost inflation. Not sure, but I'd like to see more cost saving initiatives. So you'll, ple you'll be pleased to see that I think uh, likely to meet expectations is the standout response with about 40%. Of the answers, the others are spread between teams. Um, the next closest is likely to miss due to underlying cost inflation. Um, I guess in, in the first instance, if you've got any particular comment on that, um, uh, and if I may, I've actually got a question around. Cost. I'll, I'll sneak it in there now. But um, you know, clearly, banks are faced with a weaker revenue environment given COVID. Um, you know, I think the, the group have, have been really clear about the impact of rates uh, this year. Um, but we are probably at a system level, and I think also from Standard Charter's point of view, looking at a lower revenue run rate than perhaps we thought at the beginning of this year. A lever that you have to offset that is obviously costs. I mean, how are you thinking about pulling on costs? And interested in how COVID, you know, some of the learnings, behavioural, structural shifts since the onset of the pandemic have affected your thinking there. Yeah, so, so I mean, I, I've said all along that we'll maintain cost growth below the rates of inflation in our markets, which is below 3%, uh, and, I, and I hold true to that. I think a couple of couple of levers that will give me confidence for that. The first is the, the, the investment we've done in terms of, of technology and continues to do in terms of digitization of the business. You know, I, I expect as we look forwards, somewhere between 10 and 20% of our cost stack to be transformed. You know, as we invest in, 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 in technology and that will reduce manual processing, which means you, you have a, a much greater operational leverage from your system. Uh, that allows us to then, then align coverage and product teams more, more effectively. So, so I see that coming through. And, and actually COVID has been a, as we say, an, accelerate, an accelerant of that. Um, I think the other thing that, that, that we've seen COVID do is change people's behaviours. So, you know, I, I would expect a sustained saving from travel and entertainment, from uh, marketing and from, from real estate, from, from better and more efficient use of real estate. So I think, I think they will come through and, and both of those you know, are sort of it's a virtual circle of allowing that increased investment in, in digital and technology. Perfect. Um, let's switch to the next question on how do you see Standard Chartered positioned on capital and dividends? Option scope for upside surprise when distributions resume from lower capital requirements. Number two, upside surprise from better earnings in future years. Three, downside surprise from RWA pro cyclicality still to come. Four, downside surprise from weaker earnings. Five, downside surprise from increasing regulatory requirements. So the most popular answer here with about 40%, third to 40% of the response is upside surprise from uh, when distributions resume uh, from lower capital requirements, I guess followed by potential downside surprise from RWA pro cyclicality still to come. So there's a, there's a mix of answers there. Um, I guess there's no real clear standout response there. Um, 
I guess I, I, I would be interested, obviously, you know, capital distribution is decision for the group. Um, but, you know, the, the, the divisions, commercial and CIB, that, that you're responsible for jointly, you know, make up two thirds of the group, group RWAs. Um, interested in uh, when you look out, you know, three years, five years down the line, do, do you still see the near and medium term growth opportunities across your footprint that, that justified continued investment of cost and capital in your footprint? Or are you sympathetic to the idea that COVID is the growth outlook? Actually, if growth is going to be a bit slower, it does make sense to repatriate that capital back to the group. Um, either for allocation elsewhere or you know, potentially to be returned to shareholders? So look, I think, I think we've, we've got you know, really good discipline, it can always be better, but good discipline now around allocating that capital. So I've got about two thirds of the group's capital to, 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 to make sure I'm allocating it properly. So I think that discipline around returns, which to be honest, wasn't there historically, really is now something that is embedded in the business. So, so we do, we do allocate capital to clients, and we, we talked about some of the upsides we've seen from that, even in the, the last few months, where we have been able to generate creative returns from allocating capital. I think that will continue. I think we will see opportunities for you know, generating accretive returns from allocating capital. That said, we we, we, you know, we have also said that, that when we, uh, we we maintain a strong a strong uh, capital position. And you know, after our CT1 ratio, after you know, any returns of investments, we, we, we wanted to be able to return that to shareholders. That, that hasn't changed. Um, I guess the only, the only negative in that, that sort of scenario has been, you know, we, we did see 10 yards of higher RWAs coming through from, from client downgrades. Um, we hope that will swing back. But, but on average, the increase in RWA that we see is towards return accretive client business. Perfect. Um, returning to the ARS, then, um, what are your thoughts on Standard Chartered's level of provisioning for COVID-19 risks? Number one, very well provided relative to peers. Two, better provided relative to peers. Three, broadly similar to peers. Four, slightly under provided relative to peers. Five, significantly under provided relative to peers. Um, so the standout response here is broadly similar to peers, um, which which wins by by quite some way. Um, I guess we touched upon asset quality earlier. I don't know if there's a an additional comment. No, I, I I would I would hope from a shareholder perspective that that's what what you would think. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, we don't want to be underprovided. Equally, we don't want to be overprovided. We want to be fair in terms of a, an assessment of of the risk as we see it. Uh, and, I, and I think that's where I, mean, I, I, I always think we're, we're on the slightly conservative side, but that's not a bad thing. Uh, but being in the pack, as your your audience suggests, I think is, is the right place to be. Yeah. Um, okay, final ARS question. So how should Standard Charter, uh, Standard Charter deploy its capital? Number one, invest in growth across the footprint. Two, increase ordinary dividends. Three, resume share buybacks. Four, undertake acquisitions. So, I mean, we did, we did touch upon this theme. Ago. The, the standout responses are fascinating. So the, the standout winner actually is resume share buybacks, um, which I, I, I imagine is a function of, of uh, where the share price is at the moment, uh, you know, at subdued level, as is basically every bank in the world. Um, followed by investing in growth across the footprint. I think this kind of quite clearly captures this trade-off between the growth opportunity that you have in your footprint and, you know, exploiting a subdued valuation at the group level. Which, which I think is, a, is a, a sort of accurate reflection of what Bill, Andy and, and I have said as, as we've spoken to investors about, you know, we do see opportunity and where we see opportunity, we'll take it. But, but the share price is... As I said, like many others, on the derisory side of where we'd like it to be, and, uh, and that gives you different opportunities. Okay, perfect. So I think we've got about one minute left. I'm going to sneak in one final question. You, you, didn't, you didn't get the question about you, you getting your research report up and, and getting as a strong buy. When does that come out? <laughs> I do appreciate this advertising that you do. <laughs> it's really appreciated. Um, 
one final comment on competition. We've probably got about 40 seconds before they cut us off, but um, interested in how how you're observing competition evolve in your key markets, particularly in light of COVID. Are, are you seeing things like, are people withdrawing capacity or actually uh, have we still got really strong local competitors? So I, 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 I regret to say that I still see competition as intense. Uh, and, and, and I think that's, that's a good thing because that, that shows that what I'm saying about the opportunities in, in the markets are real. Uh, we're not seeing mass withdrawals. We've seen, we've seen a couple of withdrawals from, from some of our markets historically, but not as a result of COVID. Um, what, I, what I am seeing is clients increasingly looking at that network and, and, and demanding strength across the network. So, so you know, being able to deliver the network, ultimately to be able to do that in a much more digital fashion, I think will be, that, that's been the USP that we've had. I think it becomes a greater and greater differentiator. And, and, and as clients are looking for stability and, and comfort in terms of how they're managing this, this time, that's becoming more and more important. Okay, perfect. I think we are just about on time here. So um, Simon, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Appreciate it's a busy time for, for you right now, but this has uh, been a fascinating session. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you oh, to thank everyone you. who dialed in uh, with us. We really appreciate your attention, your participation in the ARS. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Speak to you soon. Thanks a lot. Man.